question for, for Kate. The examples you, you gave suggest that designers of public spaces and uh, buildings don't seem to take into account a lot of the findings from neuroscience on head direction system uh, up to this point. Have, have you seen any signs that that is changing, that there is any uh, positive interaction between neuroscience and architecture that's taking on board some of the findings that you've reported? I think that there's the beginnings of a movement. Um, neuroarchitecture is, is becoming a thing, or neuroscience and architecture, or, or, or you know, I think there's a recognition that this type of dialogue needs to happen, um, and that's a really nice um, introduction for me to be able to say <laughs> that we are actually trying to um, form a group of um, professionals who are interested in navigation both from a scientific point of view and from the sort of industry or engineering or technology point of view, um, to try and get this dialogue going. So um, if anybody is interested in finding out more about that, then, then um, come and talk to me or email me after. We're going to have a kickoff meeting in um, a few weeks, and then we're going to have some regular meetings after that. It would be really great if anyone is interested in navigation and how people navigate and how they understand the space that they're in. It would be really great to have you on board. Great. Okay. Um, gentleman in the right, if you want to just throw it to him. Okay, or no. Hi. John Shelton from the organization Guide Dogs. Um, we're really interested in the way that people with visual impairment mentally map their environment and the way they go about orientation and navigation. One of your key findings from your research was obviously this idea of visual landmarks or anchors in the visual scene. I wondered whether you've done any neuroscience specifically looking at how people develop a sense of direction and space when they can't actually see those visual landmarks. Yeah, that's something that um, we're really interested in, not, not my lab specifically, but um, accessibility, especially for people with visual impairment or also for people um, who have navigational impairment, so Alzheimer's disease and so on. Um, it's, it's a really important thing because as I mentioned in my talk, there is more than one navigation system in the brain, and there are also there's more than one sense. So we know that even from studying rats, that they don't just use vision. You can turn the lights out, and then they can use other things like touch. So there's the you know the capacity to exploit those other senses, and we really need to understand what type of information is most useful for what kind of orientation in order to be able to provide the information for you know, blind people or um, deaf people or um, people with Alzheimer's or whatever. So it's, it's becoming quite an active area of research now. Moshe, do you want to add anything on object recognition? Well, uh, it depends on what uh, visual impairments we are there are different kinds, but many of them actually involve these like cataract and other kinds of uh, things that preclude uh, uh, perfect vision is actually is akin to low spatial frequency uh, uh, filtering. So that sometimes when people study vision, visual impairments, they put like Vaseline on glasses and kind of imitate this low spatial frequency vision. And, and uh, so I think, again, if we focus on global properties, it, but I think your question pertains to the more practical aspects of how do they interact with the environment, in which case they do need to be aware of uh, the details. So um, I'm not sure how to help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. And then, Jamie, do you want to add anything in regards to your studies? If we're going to get people at 2050, we surely need to include these demographics. Demographics? Um, well, yes. people that have visual impairments or hearing impairments. Yeah, for sure. The, um, the more the merrier. Um, we, we, like, it's such an early science, and we just we need to get um, all, all, all folks involved, um, and um, I think course, sometimes we need to prioritize um, some groups. So it's, I think in Canada, there are, there are groups who really push design orientated for children, older, older people, uh, and they're pushing on the research side and the and practice side. And um, I think that's a really interesting concept if we actually you know, do design more about the groups who are perhaps um, most vulnerable or mm. need the most support. I think that could be really big way to go here, yeah, something to prioritize. Cool, okay, next question. Uh, just here in the front. Thank you, thank you for very interesting presentations. So this is a reflection for all of you. Uh, is it possible to control for confounding factors in the field studies? When you wa want to come 
so close to reality as possible. And we all carry different perceptions, different mindsets and different filters. How do you control for this, the inside, when you measure the outside? So I can, uh, the very last study I mentioned with the collaboration with Yasha Grobman, the architect in, in the techno, with the virtual reality, I really, I'm so a uh, big fan of psychologically valid designs that I just couldn't uh, put up with the idea of virtual reality. And excuse me if anybody uses it, but it just said, I don't feel uh, reality there. And it was really hard, but they convinced me that it's, it's so, so impossible to uh, control for every aspect and just live, because we in the lab like to, to you manipulate only one dimension at a time and make sure that this is the dimension that we're measuring. But sometimes there's no, no, no uh, I mean, you can't build the same buildings and actually these beautiful buildings that we saw here and build two of them and just change the corners or change, you know, the uh, tiles. So um, we'll have to put up with averages. You're right, there's a huge diversity and people come with different time sets, diff uh, with different mindsets, with different uh, these, uh, goals, with different histories, different needs. So. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, you have to appeal to the average unless, um, unless it's dedicated for a specific population, in which case, like the, the this, you know, visual, impaired, visual impaired, so in which case you can cater more specifically. But otherwise, I think we'll have to uh, uh, look at averages more than individuals. So you have to uh, uh, look at averages more than individuals. And you, you need a, lot, a huge study yes, with yes, a lot and of the, and, uh, the, participants. The tricky uh, thing is with this uh, with this uh, uh, spaces that, that we played with, the trick is that you cannot build a building for your experiment, right? So you have to uh, look for different buildings that um, that capitalize or emphasize one of the parameters, but then, so I mean, I don't think that getting the data is the, the problem, uh, making sense of the data really the problem. But that's where virtual reality can help, because there you can build a building. And then you can vary just one parameter and then see what effect that has. So I think experimental science, you know, one of the problems with experiments is that it's a very stripped down version of reality. But the strength is that you can manipulate one variable at a time. So I think you need experiments and field studies and, and, you, and lots and lots right. of both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that, just really quickly, it's a really great question, especially uh, from an epidemiological perspective. So the, the, the study that I mentioned, um, on the risk of bias for using the Cochrane tool, confounding was the single biggest issue in, in, the, in what was, you know, in the studies. Um, and it was quite surprising sometimes with before and after studies, they, they weren't even com uh, controlling for changes in weather. So you might have captured a lot of data on a really sunny day, or no, sorry, a really rubbish day, let's say, and you come back a year later, it's a really quite a nice day. <laughs> um, you've Get, you're going to get 20% more people in the area in your sample if you're doing behavior observation. Um, and it, it, it wipes out the, you know, the impact, the effect that you're detecting. So there, there's a big, it's a big question, it needs, and we need to do lots on, on that, especially for field work, field studies. Cool. OK, we have, do we have one more question, Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Basuto. I'm with the engineering consultancy WSP in Toronto. And I have a question for Jamie. Um, I really enjoy your presentation about the science of well-being. Um, but one question I had was, I know that um, you know, in some areas of the world where there's the happiest people, they might live in relative poverty, and in other areas of the world where we are affluent, um, people aren't so happy. So is there an upper limit to design interventions about what we can do to improve well-being, or um, is it more the per people's attitudes that they approach to their environment that might be able to help them? Great, great question. Um, so like um, there's a there's a, um, a psychologist called uh, Sonia Lubomirsky in um, in the states, and she has this amazing pie chart um, that's kind of been one of the key the go-to charts. Um, and it, she breaks down the key determinants of well-being so far. Um, the first being genetics is kind of estimates 50% of, of, of all variants in well-being. 40% uh, is intentional activity. So that's the choices we make, and that's it, what you're, you're referring to in terms of attitude. That would be what you're talking about. And then only 10% only is what she calls circumstances, um, and they're the, the stable conditions that we encounter each day. So as a designer, I saw that and I was like, wow, only 10% is like, and, and, and of that 10%, um, design's only one tiny facet of that. So you've got, in that, in that category, you've got all sorts of things, um, economics, education, um, and it's like startling um, to see, and I think, but that's we, we've got. We need to. We need to come at it from her perspective because they, we're, 
we, we over-egg it, I think, quite a lot. I think there are definitely possibilities where we, we can help um, and we can make a big difference. Um, and for instance, the nature-based uh, research, so that, for instance, that, um, that study I mentioned before that's shown that proximity to green space can be as much as one third of the impact as being married um, or in a stable relationship. That they, they are giving people like Sonia Lubomirsky things to think about, definitely, and the, the pie chart's changing, going back and forth. Uh, but it's so, such early days and we need to be aware of both and we look, need to look at how they interact, um, you know, especially the moderating impacts of, of the built environment. So how we facilitate, we don't necessarily cause directly, but how we can facilitate. Um, yeah, so I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> okay, so now one last question, please. We have our body, um, the way the body is, we have our brain and we have, and therefore cognition, or whatever you might call it, and we have the environment. If we start to dissect those and don't consider the relationships between them and how they change in a systematic way, can we make then progress? Because how do we know what complexity is, for example? How do I measure what complexity is? Which aspects come into it? Um, there must be a way of quantifying all these things and how they're related to each other. Is there any process in that direction already? <laughs> <laughs> Over to my colleagues here. <laughs> I'm not fully sure I understand what you mean by quantifying... Complex. Like, like quantifying what with respect to what? Quantifying, for example, complexity to measure well-being or to measure you know, the, the, the impact um, the visual environment had, as, as, as um, Colin brought it in, or all these factors. They must have one common um, denominator um, to find out what's going on. To the effect, to the emotional effect on, on a person, ultimately? Emotional, or also how much the brain generally need, is, is needed for certain treatments, how that's related to, to the physical body we're having. And um, we are not, you know, we are not disembodied um, beings. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, so I, I see the sort of issue of holism um, slightly differently. So, so my kind of take on it is that we like um, to be holistically engaged with our environment. We, we are holistic creatures. And we like to feel sort of that, that we understand um, the things around us and, and our place in them and that we're connected with them and that we have agency and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think to create an environment where people flourish, you want people to feel that way about their environment, to feel that they, they know it. They know where they are. They know where all the surrounding regions are. They know how to get places. They, re they really feel creatures of the space they're in and not just people that are forced to move within it. So, um, so understanding um, how the environment impacts on your sense of belonging, I think, I'm not sure how to quantify things like that, but I think that's what we need a science of to some extent. That's my hand waving. Answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we'd, we'd, we'd need to, uh, I mean, there, there are, we've quantified some of those things, like, the, I keep going back to the nature based uh, studies, but we, 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 we've, there's some really good, very systematic work that's really embraced that complexity um, and is really, you know, beginning to reveal these, 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 you know, these things that we can do to to improve population flourishing. Um, so it's it's early days, but um, hopefully we'll do lots more of it and yeah, keep at it. Yeah. Cool. Do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, I, I, I actually am not that confident there is one common denominator. It's tempting to think that way, but uh, the brain and the environment are very complicated, and I wish it were so... I mean, it's a nice wish, wish but I'm not sure there's evidence that there is one explanation to everything. Uh, so I think we just have to keep on working, and quantifying is a nice aspiration, but uh, it seems too early for me in terms of, of, of the complex, complexities involved. The only thing that I do want to emphasize that I think is clear to everybody is the diversity of uh, the people who you guys design to, right? So if there's a building on the street, if I'm a tourist or if I'm rushing to work, I'll see this building differently. If I'm looking for this building versus this building is in my way to get to where I want to get, I'll, I'll look at it differently. If impaired or if I'm not impaired, if I'm a, 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 a 
I like to come here. I have positive associations with this place. If, a, if it's morning or if it's night, if a, uh, we like to uh, look at the state of mind that we call exploratory versus exploitatory. Sometimes people look for the familiar. People sometimes look for novelties. All these type of people, and I just you know gave you the, the first that came to mind. We'll see, we'll see different, uh, the same building differently. So trying to quantify and give one model of how people would feel in this building uh, is too naive, I think.